Good morning, alumni, ladies and gentlemen, guests. I'm not trying to suggest that alumni are not ladies, gentlemen and guests, but uh, it's a, an absolute pleasure to be hosting you this morning. A very special welcome to our guest of honor, Wendy Luhabi. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, my name is Nicola Klein. I'm the Dean of Gibbs. And this is a, a special event. You'll, you, those of you who spend time at Gibbs um, will know that we, we don't always do as many things as we'd like to with um, the University of Pretoria and with people coming from other campuses. So today really is a joint venture between the Gibbs Alumnus Office and the University of Pretoria Tax Alumni, uh, Alumnus Office. Um, and uh, we're delighted to be welcoming you here for this breakfast. To those of you who've braved the traffic and traveled across the highway, well done, you've made it. Who's coming here to Gibbs for the first time this morning? Is there anybody? Now check. Well, a very big welcome to you. So this is the part of the University of Pretoria that perhaps you didn't know about. Um, this is the University of Pretoria's um, business school where typically our degree offerings are, are um, postgraduate and so that's why it's not always strongly on uh, everybody's radar but it's an absolute pleasure um, to welcome you all today. We'll be having our breakfast afterwards but I think it's, it's wonderful that we're going to be um, having our guest presentations first so that will give us something to chew on. Um, when we eventually um, get, get our food at the end of this. I'm going to be asking Wendy to come up and, and speak just now, but perhaps let me just share the program. So we don't have that much time after Wendy's speech for some questions, but I'm hoping to take a couple. So please do think about your questions. And then after that, I'm going to be asking Thabo Shingange, the acting UP SRC president, to tell you a little more about the SRC bursary fund. Um, and then we'll move into having our breakfast. So the the title of Wendy's speech today is Economic Activism, and I think it's a highly appropriate theme to be speaking about given what's been playing out in so many fronts um, in the country, uh, politically, socially, economically. What is very, very clear is it's time for activism. It's not time for people to be passively sitting by um, watching what is happening. And I really can't think of anybody better than Wendy to be speaking on this topic today. Um, I, I was reflecting on first reading your book, Defining Moments, um, probably, it must have been about 10 years ago. When did you produce it, Wendy? 20 years ago. 20 years ago. So I came across a copy 10 years ago, and that was written very much from your, your perspective of looking at black managers and particularly focused on their journeys um, in the 80s, which really were a number of defining moments. I would argue that we're at defining moments again, but somebody who seems to have made defining moments a characteristic of a career um, is Wendy. She built up a phenomenal reputation as firstly a human resources executive uh, working in multiple corporates and then of course the economic participation of women through the portfolio investment company called Whipold and she's made a strong name for herself as an entrepreneur in that right um, and also launching a venture capital equity fund to invest in women owned or managed enterprise. She's playing an extensive role in supporting entrepreneurship initiatives, particularly micro bakeries and agriculture. Um, so Wendy is both a doer, I'm delighted that you've been recognized for so many of your achievements as well. She holds a number of honorary doctorates, she sits on a number of boards, um, she's involved with many global organizations and I, I seem to remember last year you going off to Buckingham Palace. So that was um, something very exciting for all of us to to share when she was appointed as an honorary lieutenant of the Royal Victorian Order by the Queen of England. In fact, that was 2013. The piece that I, I, I know I have to ask the question on that says you're, you have a son, you have two grandchildren, and you're an aspiring harpist. I don't know when you get time to learn to play the harp, but we're in awe. Ladies, gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Wendy Luhabi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I don't often agree to early morning commitments because I don't enjoy getting stuck in traffic. <laughs> I just find it such an unproductive use of time. But once in a while, I break my own rules and I say yes to do something that I don't particularly enjoy doing or when I feel that the occasion deserves it. Vuyon Tlogo, who's standing near the door, was very persistent. Initially, she invited me to come to Pretoria, and I said, there is no way I can be in Pretoria at 7.30. It just, the highway is not open for people in Joburg to be in Pretoria at 7.30, so <laughs> let's forget that idea. And she just absolutely refused to take no for an answer. And I admire that quality in people, because 
really that's, I think, what differentiates us. People who know when to say no when they need to say no, and people who are not prepared to take no for an answer when it's required. And so the reason I'm here really is, is because of her. <clears throat> I began my year in, on the 1st of January with a, a very unique experience. I went paragliding in Cape Town. And I used to look at people paragliding and I used to think there's absolutely no way I would do anything like that. And then I decided that I actually want to use 2016 as a year where I say yes to things that I'm afraid to do. And, and so that's, that's, what I, that's what I signed up for when I went paragliding. And I also wanted to use it as a year where I invite new challenges into my life. I have had many challenges, but I'm looking for, for new and different challenges. And about two weeks ago, I received an invitation that responded to what I had put out there. I was invited to consider making myself available to join the World Rugby Board. Can you believe it? <laughs> I don't know how many rugby games I've watched. I don't even think I understand it that well. But that's the invitation I received. And for a moment, I thought, how ludicrous, how crazy. And then I thought, why not? That's what I was signing up for when I went paragliding. So I've submitted my name and I'm on the short list out of 40 names that were recommended by the headhunting company. They are looking for two non-executive directors. They are transforming their board as all global sporting bodies are doing. Um, FIFA is doing the same thing. The IOC is doing the same thing. And they have two people on the short list. So, you know, it's quite likely that I will be on the board of World Rugby. <laughs> But that's not what, what I was invited to, to discuss this morning. Uh, but I just thought I, I would share um, how I started my year as I'm approaching my, my 60th year and expecting our third grandchild. I, um, I have been asked to, to speak about economic activism. How many of you have heard of that term? Because I made it up, so I, I'd be curious to hear of how many people have heard of it? Okay, four people, that's not bad. In a room of, okay. So a few years ago, I was looking at a title that better describes and reflects what I do, <coughs> that reflects my work, and that captures the passion that I've had for some of the things that I've done over the last 25 years. And I decided Given that they are political activists, <coughs> excuse me, you get environmental activists, social activists, you get activists of, of all persuasions. Why not an, an economic activist? After all, what I do really does reflect that. So I decided that I would declare myself one. And in my business card, that's what it says. I'm not a CEO of anything. I'm an economic activist. So when people see that, they're kind of taken aback. What is that? Someone asked me, actually. I said, come to Gibbs. You will find out. So I think it's pretty cool. I don't know about you. <coughs> right, the younger people would, would understand that language. The ones, you see how we've divided the room. My, the ones that are closer to my generation are sitting here. The ones that are furthest from my generation are sitting towards the back. So I think it's pretty cool to, be co to call yourself an economic activist, don't you? Yes. So, but it doesn't make me an authority, of course. I just suggest that I have some thoughts that I'd like to share. So what is my definition of economic activism? What would be yours? The people that have heard of it, what, what, what is your definition? Let me hear. What's your understanding of economic activism? There were three hands here. There was one there, so don't disappear on me. Yes, Gary. To fundamentally make a difference <coughs> through economics and empowering those less fortunate around you to actually do the deliver of that. Okay, so that's one thought. One thought. I'll go with increased active participation in a country's economy for mutual benefit. Okay. 
Okay. Yep. The lady at the back. Um, I think that actually you played a role in influencing policy pressure by some of Okay. So it, it's all of those things, and I'm sure many other definitions. So let me share some of my thoughts, and I, I'm really choosing these because they, they reflect how I've participated as an, as an activist in the economy. So for me, economic activism involves using economic power for change. Some of us have economic power, and I think all of us actually have economic power. Because if you buy a product, that gives you economic power. And so you can decide if you choose that product or that product. And if one product represents a company that is abusive, you can decide that you're no longer going to support that product, right? So I think we all have economic power, and we can use it for change if we're conscious about it and if we decide to do that. It focuses on the idea of using one's wealth to represent one's values, as I've just described. And it seeks to transform what, particularly in an environment like South Africa, is an, a, an exploitative economic structure. And I, I will share what, what I mean by that. Economic activism is needed now more than ever, given the current state of not just South Africa's economy, but the global economy, and the economic inequity that really exists in society. We have just such huge gaps of inequality, particularly in this country. What do I mean by wealth? I'm referring to financial resources, of course, that, that's obvious, we, we all understand that. But more importantly for me, I'm referring, when I talk about wealth, I'm also referring to what most of us have. We all have knowledge, we all have experience, we all have time, we all have skills, right? That for me represents wealth. Wealth represents something that we have that we can give away. So I don't think that we should, confi we should confine our understanding of what wealth represents to just money. And I don't think that we should put or place a much higher value on money, because if we don't have money, does that mean that we should not participate? I don't think so. I think that we have other things that we can use to engage and to participate and to contribute and to be, to be champions of change. So I'm suggesting that there are other things that we have which are not necessarily money that we can use to enable many people around us to improve their lives, to change their circumstances, to improve their prospects, and for them to achieve progress in their life. Isn't that what we're all looking for? And are these not the ingredients that are, are necessary for us to become an amazing nation? I mean, I, I keep believing that because South Africa is just such a unique country and we haven't even begun to tap into the possibility that this nation represents. And I think it's because our, our understanding of what we can contribute has been limited to, to things that we don't have. But I think if we, we really look at ourselves, we all have something that we can contribute to someone else. And, and that for me is what represents wealth. So I'd like to advocate for two models of economic activism. Firstly, economic activism through financial resources, which can be a contribution towards education, uh, towards charities. A lot of people are involved in charities or various causes. It can also be when we make socially responsible investments, which is, which is uh, uh, something that is growing, a philosophy that is really gaining momentum in, in society and, and all over the world. Or it can be in collaborative sharing of resources. For example, 
when we established WePold about 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago now. That's really how we created WePold. We created a, a, a platform that enabled women who earned very little and women who had a lot of money to participate in becoming investors in the South African economy for the first time. So when we did our initial rights offer, you could purchase shares in WePold for as little as 600 rand. Each share was two, two, two rand. And there was no cap to how much you could, uh, to, you could invest on the upside. And because we, we made it accessible to people who had very little resources and people who had a lot of resources, we were able to mobilize South African women for the first time, 18,000 of them, if you can believe it, to raise 25 million rands of their own money, something that had never been done before. And they followed those rights uh, a few months later with another 75 million rands. So in total, in a space of one year, South African women, black and white, rural, urban, poor, wealthy, from all walks of life, raised 100 million rands of their own money. I think that's pretty remarkable. And that, for me, is an example of what can be achieved when we share our resources and we collaborate together. WePoll still exists today. It was amongst the first generation of economic empowerment companies long before economic empowerment had a definition or had policies and, and whatever else is happening around the BEE codes. And the, 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 the few companies, there were about three other companies that started at the same time with WePoll, the first, what are called the first generation of economic empowerment companies in the early 90s. They don't exist anymore. And when they wound down, they did not empower thousands of women. They empowered four individuals in each case. And, and that's unfortunate, because the intention of economic empowerment or black economic empowerment was really for those of us who have opportunities and resources and the expertise to use it to bring a greater participation of people into the economy. So that, that would be one example. Social invest, uh, responsible investments involve investing to drive changes in the marketplace. For example, something um, that we've probably been following over the last few months uh, with someone who is associated with, with Gibbs is Wendy Applebaum, how she single-handedly took on the garnishing and the micro, -lend uh, the micro lending industry that has been exploiting poor people for years, charging obscene interest rates. She won the case, and she's currently in the Constitutional Court. I mean, for me, that is an example of how we can use our influence to really become an activist in the economy. Poor people who cannot afford to pay the kinds of interest rates that we charge them, 30% and upward. People who buy a fridge that costed 1,000 rands and by the time they finish, it costs them 60,000 rands. I mean, that's daylight robbery. That, that should not be allowed and happens right under the nose of government. How does that happen? You know, so when I was referring earlier to changing an exploitative economic structure, I had, I had that in mind. So for me, this kind of investing should not just be limited to the wealthy in society. It can be done by concerned citizens, it can be done by ordinary people like you and I, who take upon themselves the role of championing economic justice in society. So that, that's really, so we, we have the kind of inequality gap we have in this country because the degree of economic injustice is, is really quite shocking. The extent to which we allow an economic structure that exploits people who can least afford it is really unacceptable. That's why we have such, because the, otherwise it doesn't make sense, because on the one hand, when you look at the, uh, the lifestyle living measures and how a large number of people have moved into, into the middle class, you know, the lower middle class and, and, and the upper middle class, it doesn't make sense that we have the kinds of inequalities that we have. You know, so we have to look somewhere else. We have to try and understand what else is happening in the economy that is creating this reality. 
So I believe all of us in this room, in this nation, have a responsibility to influence relevant social issues in society. For example, the crisis in education. So for me, education is not a crisis of learning. It's actually related to the economy. Because if we don't have properly educated and properly equipped people, we are not going to have an economy. Who's gonna run the economy? You know, so there, there's, there's a direct link and a direct relationship between the state of education in a nation and the ability of a nation to continually innovate its, its, its economic uh, prospects and its economic opportunities. And, and so really, I think that we should, we should own the crisis that currently exists in our country around education. You know, we shouldn't say it's got nothing to do with me. My children were lucky enough to have education and they, they're not affected. Well, they may not be your children, but we are all affected because we're talking about building the, the, the legacy of our future. Do you understand? So really, I, I want to invite you. So all of last year, I, I undertook to support a project called Partners for Possibility. Have you heard of it, Nicole? And it, it's just, for me, the most amazing vision. I mean, there are many things that people are doing in education. So I'm not being critical because we're not doing anything. I think that business has really put its shoulder to the wheel and individuals have done the same thing and people are really doing what they can to, to try and solve the education crisis. So what Partners for Possibility does is they partner business people with school principals from under-resourced schools. And it's a, it's a year's partnership, so it's a long commitment. So last year, I got involved in the program and I partnered with a school principal in Davidson, which is where I grew up. And I cannot tell you what a remarkable privilege this was. The idea is not to go and fix something. So we don't approach the program because there's something wrong to be fixed. The idea is that there's an experience that people in business have that could be of value to the education system. And, and, and it was really the most amazing experience for me. So the second model of economic activism is through mentorship, for example. I do a lot of mentorship. Mentorship of younger generations. Because to a large extent, a lot of people who come into the workplace still come from homes where their parents have not worked in a corporate environment. So how are they supposed to know how to be in a corporate environment or in a workplace? How do they know that? Where do they get their skills from? If, if your mother has been a domestic worker, how are you supposed to know how to conduct yourself when you start working? Giving away clothes through charity or helping new graduates, a lot of new graduates who come from the rural areas don't have the proper clothes to wear when they go for their interviews. You know, so this could be another example of how we can be of value to someone else. Giving away to I mean, toys that our children no longer need to children from, from homes of underprivileged um, you know, circumstances. Or collecting food from restaurants to give to the homeless people. You know, so we can't really sit where we are and say, I have nothing to contribute. We have something that we can contribute. As I said, we have our experience, we have time, we have our skills, and we have things that we no longer need in our lives. A lot of us have wardrobes that are bursting at the seams. You know, that really needs to be cleared. You know, if we live in a cluttered environment, then the, 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 what, what the saying is that then our minds are cluttered. I don't know, my desk is so cluttered. <laughs> but I've also seen something that says a, the, 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 a cluttered desk is the sign of a genius. Isn't that, a, 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 so I'm, I'm not sure which one is correct, so. So for me, the principle behind economic activism is, is the one of sharing. You know, that let, let, let's develop a culture of sharing as a society, of collaboration, you know, where we have something that someone doesn't have. Let's collaborate so that we can make a difference. The culture of giving. And South Africa actually is really quite generous. So I think we, we rate quite highly in, in, in the culture of giving. 
the culture of empowerment in the true sense. You know, and for me, real meaningful empowerment is when we teach people to fish, not when we give people a fish for a day. That, that's not empowerment. And so we need to, to really reframe our thinking of what empowerment means in a society like South Africa that has the kind of legacy that we have, that is battling with education the way that we have. How can we use ourselves to enable someone else to really be empowered, I mean, to be empowered and to believe that they truly can be someone in society? Ultimately, we need to use our influence to build responsible economies. I think that economies have pockets of responsibility, but we also know that there are industries in the economy that are irresponsible, that exploit circumstances, that exploit people. We should use our influence to reinforce good behavior and to remove economic exploitation from society. This can only be achieved if you and I become champions of positive change wherever we witness an, in, an injustice. It doesn't have to be an economic injustice, any kind of injustice. I think that if we can stand for that as a nation, that we will not tolerate any kind of injustice in our society, we will begin to move towards building a society that we can be proud of to hand to, to our grandchildren. I have three, so I'm concerned about these issues. I look around and, and I really want to play a role to make sure that I leave a legacy that they can be proud to inherit. And I think that applies to all of us. How many people are grandparents here? Am I the only one? Roshin, you're a grandparent. <laughs> She's my god grandparent. Too, too many businesses are built by exploiting ignorant, uneducated, and unsuspecting consumers. When I grew up, it used to be higher pages. You won't know. This is I don't know. I don't think it still exists. Does higher pages still exist? Or is it lay by? Okay, is that the same thing? Gary, you're the, who's the financial wizard? In the last 30 years, it has been micro-lending, as, as I've alluded to, and it's been much worse. It really, it's, it, yeah, I mean, I think we all know. So let me conclude by borrowing from someone called Shalin Fadirepo, who proposes four strategies that we can practice for everyday economic activism. But before that, let me just say this. Overall, economic activism begins with you and I taking responsibility on how we spend <coughs> our most important resources, and that is our time, our money, our resources, our knowledge, our wisdom, our experience. That's really where it begins, because we all have all of these things to a lesser degree or to, to a greater degree. It doesn't matter if we have very little of it or if we have a lot of it. What matters is that we are conscious about how we use it to enable and to equip other people and, and just to shape you know, the lives of people that are around us. So that, that would be my, my, my invitation to, to all of us. So Shalin's four strategies are the following. They're very simple, actually. The first one is living within our means. This is something that my mother taught me at a very young age. A lot of people are over-indebted, and that's irresponsible, because then it creates a society of people who say, we have nothing, I, I live in so much debt, I have nothing to contribute to anyone else. I think that's selfish, to be so over-indebted that you, you have no capacity to contribute towards someone else. So she suggests that living within our means allows us to practice economic activism on a day-to-day -day basis, because then we don't have to pay these high interest rates to financial institutions that don't need it. Because the money that we live on, that we don't own, is not for free. It belongs to someone else, and so we have to pay for it. So financial management and financial intelligence are important and critical tools for life, especially for young people. I really encourage you that you look at how you live your life. Don't, don't keep up with the Joneses don't, because you don't know how they're living. Maybe they're stealing or I don't know what they're doing. Maybe they're corrupt. Just look at what you have and make the most of what you have. 
The second strategy that uh, Charlene proposes is supporting businesses that are responsible, something that I, I alluded to as well. In Africa, a, an African writer once said, we consume things that we don't make, and we make things that we don't consume. And that's really the reason why we're in the state that we're in. When we begin to produce the things that we consume, something will shift. We will see our economy grow to levels that we never thought were possible. So I think that it's important that we support businesses that reflect our values and our principles. There's no reason why we should support businesses that treat us disrespectfully. Why? Why do we do that? Why do we take our money to a place that does not value who we are as, as a, or doesn't value our patronage? They don't deserve our time or our money, I would argue, right? Let me unpack what I mean by, by that, just by sharing a statistic. If we take one dollar and, and how many times it circulates in different economies, you will get the picture of what I mean when I say we produce things we don't make and we make, we make things that we don't, we, don't produce, I mean we don't consume. So a dollar circulates in Asian communities for a month, for a whole month. In the Jewish community, it circulates for 20 days. In the white community, it circulates for 17 days. How many days do you think it circulates in the black community? It doesn't, yeah, it's closer to it doesn't. Six hours. It only spans six hours. So for me, there lies the mystery. And when I got involved in the micro bakeries, Nicola, it was because the micro bakeries are in communities. <coughs> and it's a business that enables people who have no prospects because they have no education, they, they, they have no opportunities, to provide something that the community there consumes. Every community in the township consumes bread. Every home consumes at least two loaves of bread even if they are poor. So when you build a business like the micro bakeries, they enable people around the community of where the baker is to buy the bread. It's fresh bread, it has no chemicals in it, it's even competitively priced. It's two rand lower than what you would pay for bread that's filled with chemicals and that's really of no nutritional value to anyone. So that we can begin to change that, that dynamic. And it's a small example, I think, of what's possible. The third uh, strategy that she suggests is investing in our career advancement and personal development. We, we can't abdicate that responsibility to companies that employ us. We have to be prepared to make that investment in ourselves. We all have gifts, but they have to be developed. They don't just mushroom you know, because they get watered, but we have to be prepared to look at what, what development do we need to grow as people? Because we, we can only add increasing value in society when we develop as, as people. And then the last one that she recommends is building wealth for our families. For a lot of black families, in my family, for example, I'm the first generation that's going to be able to leave something behind. My parents couldn't afford it. In white families, in most white families, not all of them, they've inherited wealth over generations. So we need to be mindful of that. You know, we can't live our lives and consume everything that we own and expect each generation to start from the beginning. For example, uh, Roisin taught me two things. One was that from her experience, her grandmother paid for the education of the grandchildren and made sure that the grandchildren have a home. Something that had never crossed my mind. And it actually makes sense, because if your grandchildren have, your grandchildren have good education and they have a home, they already have a, a start in life. But for a lot of us, we have to start by looking for a home. We can't afford, we rent a home. 
and we don't realize that the amount of rent that we pay could actually pay a bond because we don't have the knowledge. Who is teaching us these things? So I think it's important, particularly for the younger people, that we take responsibility to learn about how we manage our money, how we create wealth for ourselves, and how we control debt. Debt is a real poison in society. And how we save. South Africa has some of the, we have the lowest level of savings in the world because we consume everything. We're such a consumer uh, society. We need to save, we need to invest, we need to create wealth for ourselves and acquire assets that grow over time. Buying a Bentley, I have a girlfriend who turned 60 and she bought herself a Bentley or one of those cars. And I thought, wow, wow. <laughs> but that's what she wanted, you know, that's, that's her choice. I wouldn't make that kind of a choice. If I had enough money to buy, it's not a, what car did she buy? It's not a Bentley, but it's one of those cars that's million plus. Bentley, I don't think it's a, maybe it's a Maserati, I don't know. And I can't remember, I don't even know cars. I should, because I'm associated with a car company. <laughs> you know, so if I had that kind of money, I would contribute towards a scholarship. For example, I started a Wendy Luhype scholarship at, at the University of Johannesburg, because I was a chancellor there. And so I, I just felt, and it's in Jobek, you know, the, I just, I live here, it's better for me to contribute to that. So if I had a million rands and more to buy a car, I would rather put it there and educate a number of people. You know, so I think that our, our values in society really need a shift, ladies and gentlemen. We, we you know, we, 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 we have to be the change that we want to see in, in our society and in our nation. And in closing, I just want to remind you about the power of, of economic activism. South Africa's apartheid system was brought to its knees by economic boycotts. So let's think about that. That's the power that it has. You know, but we can use it in different ways. We can use it through our consumer activism, or we can find other ways to make sure that we live in a society that is that honors the justices that I think belong to, to, to all of us. So I want to argue that economic activism is a powerful tool for change. I don't know about you, I've used it over the last 20 something years and it really has served me. So I would welcome your thoughts and your reflections. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. I'm fortunate because I was not brought up to conform. So I don't conform, so I don't understand what you're describing. So for me, challenging the establishment, not, not because I just want to challenge it, because I think that something different can be created. I just think that we need to encourage more and more people to be the change that they want to see. If we're not prepared to do that, who must change it? You know, so those of us who feel strongly enough about the, the circumstances and the conditions in our nation, I think should actually find the courage to change it. Whether you're rejected or you are seen as a virus is neither here nor there. Ultimately, at the end of your life, you will look at what, what role did you play in living your life? You know, you're not going to measure the contribution of your life in terms of what people thought of you. So perhaps the first thing to do is to disabuse ourselves from what people think about us. We don't need approval from anybody to change the world. We just need our permission. So that would be my invitation. I'm also on conference, you know, it's one of those interests that um, the students work in, you know, and you know, the um, Thank you very much. Um, I think um, the Esmasi Tats, um, or the Esmasi team in that game, ties in very well with what Mamba was speaking about of economic activism and how we want to be, you know, the driving force of change within our um, community communities moving forward. 
And what we can pick up from this is that um, the 2015 Fusion of Sport protest, you know, highlighted a very serious concern in our education system um, in South Africa. And it was primarily a cry um, to release students from what they deem to be the exorbitant tuition fees of institutions of higher learning and the need to end the people to come the privatization of our education system. So, but also what became um, apparent to the work large was the need to come up with sustainable solutions uh, moving forward uh, to alleviate the financial burden on students while also ensuring that we keep our institutions financially surviving. We, as students, as students really of course, we understand and appreciate the government provisions in terms of the 4.5 um, billion as a quantified billion as a shortfall. Uh, but also as a parent, what's evident at this stage is that even the substantial injection into the financial uh, into the education system one is not sustainable in terms of the amount of people it has um, to incorporate and to feed in that regard. So we as the SRC of the University of Victoria have conceptualized the drive which we have called the UPS of the Tin and Man game, uh, with the University of Commerce getting the game, which is our contribution as an SRC um, towards building more inclusive and accessible institutions for the The plan of course um, to raise 10 million as a minimum is to assist students of the so-called missing minimum. That is usually your tool based for the master system, your tutorial control for the education system in and of itself. As well as students, of course, with other historical debts and financial challenges in the institutions of our learning. Um, how we have set up this line in and of itself, it would include, or not limited to, um, the direct SMS line, um, donations, direct donations, of course, alumni, you know, just fast approaching, as well as, you know, approaching general companies and people in society. Uh, we have the funds to, we have the economic capacity, the economic activism and then assist us in pushing the, the financial contribution going forward. The central message right behind this campaign is that your change can make a change. You know, seated here today when I came this morning, I was told I'm going to meet the university campus at 6 o'clock in the morning so I can be at Upper 7. And I thought to myself, which business line of person will wake up at Upper 7 in the year? But then here today I can confirm uh, what an American man once said. I think he said, you know, I was asked, um, do you ever sleep in the city? Well, city mm -hmm. So, you know, I think this is just where it's going to be is people who are anything but broke. Mm -hmm. um, we, like, I, like I was saying, the central message behind the campaign is that your change can make a change, which, you know, not only affects one life, but can trickle down within a community, within a family, and eventually within the entire educational system um, can move forward, which is why we invite the entire university of Victoria, the public, the private sector, as well as the community to join and form part of this campaign, uh, which is not necessarily a short term but a long term um, establishment which we'd like to be behind in the university. Taken from the former president of South Africa, the late president Nelson Mandela, he had said that education is the most powerful weapon one can use to change the world. From this, we hope that institutions of higher learning will not be deprived of individuals who are academically deserving, they're financially unstable to enter within this economics and this, this educational system, which is probably a prerequisite at this day and age from the market uh, industry, of course, moving forward. The SRC, of course, believes that it's imperative to align this campaign with people and organizations which have benefited from the institution of itself and who can, in their capacity, their individual capacity, or within their economic climate capacity contributes and assist in the work um, towards moving the university forward and student forward. So we're trying to align ourselves uh, in that regard. Um, following our online launch on the 24th of January, or rather the 18th of February, because we have by a week, uh, we activated on campus. I think on that day I was also shocked myself with just over 2 million number of donations from our guests who were there uh, in, that, in that moment. So it, it says a lot about economic activism and the role of people to assist once the opportunities have been provided, the proposals have come forward, and it also ties into what you were saying, the confidence to approach people in that regard. Um, so we believe this campaign in and of itself can be a driving force moving forward. Of course, within the last two weeks, uh, the university was going through what I can term a, a, you know, a rough patch in the institution of higher learning. But I was to say we are back to reaffirm the position of institutions of higher learning and the need for its and student leaders you know, to constantly shape the future of our country uh, moving forward because we're in a dire situation which needs strong leadership on both sides of the spectrum. Um, there's a, a quote I'd like to read actually by Lyndon Johnson, which highlights that we have entered an age in which education is not just a luxury, permitting some people an advantage over others. It has become a necessity without which a person is defenseless in this complex industrialized society. We have truly entered the 
century of the educated being. Now for me, I found this quote of the statement to be very powerful in the sense that it highlights that education or the education system is the only means of survival left at this point in time. Take a look at some point in time during the other eight years of which I was not even a human being by the time. Um, the matrix certificate was probably your entry into the market world. But now we've reached a stage in, in time whereby, you know, a matrix certificate can't even get you a job as a security anymore. You probably need to go beyond the bounds of a matrix certificate into the academic uh, institutes of higher learning and get a degree. And we're fast approaching a position in life where even a mere degree is no longer you know, equivalent for you have to extend it to your honours, to your masters, and to your PhDs. So the University of Pretoria's SRC is currently working on fundraising ideas as we realize the critical time we are facing um, with limited resources as well. So we have developed ways to remedy the situation. We can guarantee you that with the assistance of people seated here today, not only in this room or confined to this room alone, but also outside uh, within our media community. I mean, if we can raise 2.5 million a day without the assistance of government, then it raises the question as to, to resolve the current economic crisis in our situation, in our country, rather, are we looking at the right places? Is it always necessary to look towards the Yes, the government has a role to play. I mean, you know, they are the state, they need to provide for their citizens and so forth. But we raised 2.5 million outside of the 4.5 show for the quantification they provided. Are we looking at the right places? So I think it ties in with the whole idea of economic activism and the need for the economic activism coming from major stakeholders um, who can influence change outside of the, the normal government. And that's what this campaign primarily seeks to, you know, to achieve. But the UPS RC Timberland game rests solely on everyone's commitment to get into the game um, and, you know, in a spirit of partnership and mutual cooperation moving forward. The whole idea of the game is, you know, I was um, a student once approached me on campus and said, uh, so please tell me, how do I win this team? <laughs> the idea is not that we are campaigning something where somebody stands a chance to win 10 million and God, I wish that was the case. But the whole idea of a game is to say that a game can mean pretty much anything. It means a 10 million soccer game because it's limited to a soccer game in and of itself. But it's the whole idea to say that people need to play a part um, of the whole play of words on the play. You need to play your part in terms of shaping the future of a country. It could mean anything. It could mean a, a, in a soccer game. It could be a charity game towards a client. That is a part of playing a part with this thing. It could be an economic game, you know, economic activism in that regard. So the whole idea rests on the notion of people playing their part in the institutions of how they move forward. And that's the appeal in which we come forward as an SRC. Not only at the, at the University of Victoria, I mean, uh, at UJ just the other day, they hosted an alumni dinner in which in one night they raised from the state and uh, was just about 30 million over an alumni dinner. And that is really saying that student leaders come to the forefront of, you know, from protesting and peace must fall. But we're not coming up with solutions to say that, okay, here are some solutions. How can the economic um, environment assist us moving forward? First of the access campaign, which raised about, I think it was two million at the time, I last checked in at UCT, Standard Watch. So three people already come to the front. But at the same time, we appeal to people who are in a position of influence to come meet us halfway and shape positively the future of our country. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the 10 minute event I came from the University of Victoria, which of course during the mental session I'll be pleased to share more information. Thank you very much.